So my name is uh, Megan Dawson and I'm talking about how we use uh, Julia at Fugro. So first, what is Fugro? So we predominantly deal with geodata, that is data or information that is associated with a given location. Um, so let's say you want to put a wind farm in, you've got all these wind turbines, you might want to know about the, the sea surface or the, the surface underneath, um, and that, that's something Fugro does. Um, we also do things across many different industries, so energy, water and infrastructure, um, and we are working towards uh, net zero and we've pivoted heavily from the oil and gas to renewables. So we have these, these brand new unmanned uh, vessels, uh, but that's not what I do. So I'm in inspection and monitoring land and we predominantly deal with uh, airborne LIDAR. So that's where a plane flies along and it sends a laser pulse, and from the signal return, you know information about what it has, has intercepted. So like with the, the road markings from the, the car example, you can see um, things that are highly reflective, so those, those white strips of paint versus the asphalt, so that's kind of the uh, reflectance. And also, say you hit a, a leaf, you might get a, a small peak, and the signal can continue on and then hit the ground, so you can get multiple returns from one uh, laser pulse. One other thing to highlight is we have a lot of data. So on average, we get 1.2 terabytes per system on the plane, and we have multiple going at one time. Now, we have all that lovely LiDAR data. What do we do with it? So once we have our point cloud, our clients often would want it to be classified. So that's where they want to know for each point, what does it belong to? Did it hit a ground? Did it hit the side of a building? Um, we've got turquoise in there for road. Uh, vegetation, green, and often we do power lines, so the, the wires and the poles from the uh, network. Uh, some higher level information we ever want to derive from that is from those points which as a group represent one object. So you might have uh, an entire building, they're one cluster of points, or these points all belong to one tree. And then further on from that, again, we can derive geometric representations. So if you have your points for your power pole, you can represent it as a top and a bottom. So two points in 3D, and that line can be a geometric representation. And similarly for the, the wire, we can use a catenary equation. Once we have all this information about our world, we can provide some analysis on top of that. So description of the objects themselves, how big is the tree, how big is the building, um, and how they interact. So is this tree too close to your power line? Now I'm going to talk about the point cloud classification because it's our most um, productionalized pipeline and how we kind of do this at scale. So our models we are aiming for as being as general as possible so they can work on lots of different sensors and different densities of point cloud data and they are combinations of machine learning as well as some geometric bespoke cleanup algorithms. So when we do this in production, we operate at scale on the cloud, AWS, and we also have a very productionalized stable build process that goes across different environments. So initially your code, um, you might be researching, trying, testing things locally. Once you're ready to create your PR and commit it um, to deploy to the dev environment, that will be uh, reviewed. And then when everyone is happy on the uh, merge, it will kick off automatic deployment processes as well as automatic training at scale in the cloud. Then we can review it in that dev environment, do some validation, look at our confusion matrices. Um, and then if we're happy, set up a, a PR to deploy to UAT. When that goes through, it kicks off more automated actions that do some testing on validation data as well as putting some nice pretty dashboards for people. And finally, to get to prod, our SMEs will test in that UAT environment. All right, so when we do our inference at scale, we have our, our cluster admin, which is our, our cloud um, orchestrator. That's, that's not my team, another team does that. Um, but in that, it's basically a web page where they can select what models they want to run, uh, the data, which has to be uploaded to S3 in the cloud as well, and where they want their results to go. So it will, um, here we can see that our head node controls our EC2 workers. It pulls the models as well as the, the point cloud data from S3, and then we'll output it into S3. Um, this is a, a production pipeline here that had over 3,000 tiles, um, and it took 15 hours to run. So quite high scale. We can have tens of thousands of kilometers and thousands of millions of uh, points running through.
All right, so how do we do this? How do we have our automated build processes? So we, from the GitHub action, we will build a Docker container. We're running latest Julia 1.10, but we can configure that. Um, and we pre-compile to create the, the system image, and that will run our full test suite and example cases to ensure it's fast each time. So for each of those jobs that are running, we want it to be as fast as possible. At the moment, we have a very large Docker file. That's kind of something I'm keen to be fixed. <laughs> All right, so here's an example of our GitHub action. So here, once the, the, the PHR has, has been approved and merged, it will bump up the, the version and build the Docker, so it's half hour to build that. It will release it, so that's copying it over to the appropriate location in the cloud. Um, and then we've got a few other actions here which will tell the cluster admin, here's a new version you need to use. Now for the models, so once you, and it, it does, so from the repo, it will notice the changes to the specific model that you have modified, and that model will be copied up, um, as well as we have some automated here, uh, is the, the kickoff of our training pipelines. So those training pipelines from that uh, GitHub action, it places a message on our SQS queue, and that will kick off our cluster admin training pipeline. Uh, and so the model will be updated in the S3 location. Now, here's an example of the, the UAT. So there, there is many different uh, automated pipelines kicked off. So you have your, your UAT Docker, where it will copy the dev environment to the UAT, as well as the models. And this one here is for our test framework. So this is where we have released the new model to UAT and we want it to run that validation test so we can update our dashboard and also uh, notify our SMEs. It does send a, um, a pretty cool little Teams message telling them here's the model, go check it out, look at the dashboard. Um, I'm, I would like them to have a little button, approve button that talks back, but we're working on that. All right, and then, so this is the, the testing framework. So the um, tests are on the, the different classes specifically. And these are very hard edge cases. So this will be where the little bits of the building are super close to the trees. So these are super hard test cases. Um, and what you can drill down further, so this is the, the ground one, and you can see there's sort of three different test cases we have in there. So if it's nice, nice and flat, we have much higher accuracy at the top. Um, when it gets steep and mountainous, um, and when it's rolling, we have different accuracy, but still pretty high, 98%. Um, and just recently, we've gone through a, an exercise to make it a lot faster. So the time that the pipeline takes to run is also measured in those validation tests. And we've got it going down, so we've made serious improvements. That's with compiling the system image, um, as well as rolling forward to the, the latest Julia, uh, and some internal uh, changes we made to how we buffer and handle our tiles. And that's it. Any questions? Any questions? So do you retrain the models every time you have new code deployed? We retrain the models if the model changes, but if the Docker or the, the code that's run, let's say it's a small bug fix for something deep buried in one of our packages, we won't necessarily need to retrain the model. Any more questions? No, um, then I think uh, we'll thank you again.